Hi, I'm Lisa Bonzel, Senior Clinical Editor for Lippincott Nursing Center. Welcome to the Lippincott Clinical Leaders Podcast. Today I'm joined by Robin Coyne. Robin is the Content Editing Manager for Lippincott Procedures. Her background includes working as the Neurology Consult Nurse Practitioner for Penn Presbyterian Medical Center, as well as working as a research assistant, supporting students as a teaching assistant for advanced physiology classes, and lab faculty for physical assessment courses. Thanks for joining me, Robin. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Today, we're gonna talk about the NIH Stroke Scale. So let's start with, what is the NIH Stroke Scale? So the NIH Stroke Scale is a standardized way to um, quantify neurologic deficits. So it's used in the acute care setting when a patient comes in as a strokeler or if a strokeler is called on the floor. It is a way to systematically evaluate the severity of the deficits, plan treatment, predict outcomes, and also to monitor progress as the patient progresses through that acute stroke phase. Um, so each item on the scale is graded. Um, each item has a, a different scale, but they're graded with uh, lower numbers being more normal, higher numbers, more impairment. Um, a score of zero is someone who has no neurological deficits. Um, and we use the NIH stroke scale to determine, like I said, eligibility for thrombolytic administration, so um, TPA, uh, or endovascular treatment, and then uh, in post-administration monitoring. So that can be done by nurses, providers, practitioners, um, kind of depending on what on your facilities policies, who does that monitoring after administration. Um, so a couple of important things to remember about the NIH stroke scale is you must follow the instructions exactly. There are different um, booklets and downloads, PDFs that you can have if this is something that you're doing often. I recommend that until you really get it, um, until it becomes second nature that you know it very well. Um, this is because it, the inter-rater reliability is very important. So if you're asking a question in a different way, that could change the outcome of the scale. Um, it's important to grade the patient based on what they do, not what you think they can do. So if you think the patient's not really trying and they could probably keep their arm up for five seconds, you're not gonna grade them for that. You're gonna grade them for the fact that they only kept their arm up for two seconds. Um, you're gonna grade quickly because as we all know, time is brain. So it's important to do this quickly, but accurately. So that's why it's really important that if this is something that you're gonna be doing or something that you do do often, you really take the time to look at it, understand it and know it kind of like the back of your hand. Um, and then the last thing is don't coach the patient except where it's allowed on the form. And it will say, you can encourage the patient. Um, you always want to administer things, administer the stroke scale items in the order listed because some of them do depend on a previous assessment. You're going to record each, uh, the patient score in each category, and then um, at the end you will add all those up together. Never go back and change a score, even if the patient does do something later on without you asking. They didn't do it when you asked them the question, so don't go back and change it and follow the directions provided for each exam technique. Again, like I said, scores should reflect what the patient does. Record the answers while you're administering it. It's a lot to remember, so make sure you're writing it down. It'll make it much easier to add things up in the end, I promise. And then don't repeat the requests multiple times. Don't coach the patient. Don't say, oh, you can you know, just do a little bit more. Just do this, just do that. Just give them the prompt, see what they do, and then score them. That's so helpful, Robin. Thank you. So what are the components of the scale? So the first component is level of consciousness. So for a level of consciousness, we have a scale from zero to three, the first being alert, responsive, um, and then a, scale, a score of three would be response only with reflex uh, motor or autonomic effects or totally unresponsive, no reflexes. Um, no muscle tone. Um, so to assess the level of consciousness, you're going to ask um, two questions. What's the month and what's the patient's age? You, they'll get zero points if they get both of those questions right. They'll get two points if they get both of them wrong. Um, and then the third part of level of consciousness is you're going to ask two uh, ask the patient to follow two commands. First one being open and close your eyes. The second one is to grip and release a hand. Um, if they have weakness in one hand or have a hemiparesis, you will ask them to do the non-paretic hand. And that, again, is zero to two. Zero, meaning that they do both commands correctly. Two, meaning that they do neither one. Um, section number two is gaze. So we're going to be assessing horizontal eye movements only. 
So zero would be normal eye movement, normal gaze. Uh, and one would be a partial gaze part palsy. Two points would be a forced deviation or a total gaze paresis that is not overcome um, by the oculocephalic maneuver. And the third section is visual fields. So you're going to test um, either finger counting or confrontation in your uppers and lowers. Uh, and that is on a scale of zero to three. So zero being normal visual fields, no field loss. And then a three would be a bilateral hemianopia, um, which would be blindness or cortical blindness. Number four is your facial, facial palsy. So uh, facial weakness, facial drooping. So zero is normal, symmetric. One would be minor paralysis. Um, so that is just some flattening of the nasal labial fold or asymmetry and smiling. Two is partial paralysis, so a total paralysis of the lower face. And then three is um, complete paralysis, so that extends up into the forehead. They're going to lose these wrinkles um, in their forehead if they have weakness up there. Uh, then we move on to the motor, motor scale. So first we have um, arms. You're going to have the patient hold each arm up. They're going to test it separately for the right and left arm. Hold it up. Uh, and ask them to hold it up for a full 10 seconds. You can count out loud. Um, and then depending on how long they're able to hold it up, you're gonna grade it from zero, which is no drift. They're able to hold it there to four, which is they're not able to hold that arm up at all. Uh, and then same thing with the leg. Ask them to hold their leg up at a 30 degree angle for a full five seconds. Again, zero to four, zero being uh, no drift down back to the bed and four is no movement at all. You're gonna do that both for the left and the right leg. So number seven is gonna be limitaxia. This is where you're gonna test finger, nose, finger to see if they can touch their nose to your finger back to their nose. There are um, conditions for this if a patient is blind um, or if they have amputations, there are other ways to, to test this, but we won't get into that right now. And then for the lower extremity, you're going to have them take their heel, put it on the opposite leg at the knee, slide it down to the toe and back up again. Um, and then your scale for this one is um, zero to two and uh, zero being absent, no ataxia. They're able to do all this correctly, two meaning that they have ataxia in two limbs. Uh, Number eight is sensory. Um, again, on a scale of zero to two, zero being normal, one is a mild sensory loss, and two is a severe total sensory loss. They're not aware of that side of, of being touched at all on that side of their body. Um, and then uh, anyone who is not able to respond, um, they're going to get the two points for that one as well because they're not able to tell you where they are feeling or not feeling. Um, the next section is language. So that is a zero to three scale. And uh, a zero would be no aphasia, normal fluency, normal receptiveness, uh, reception. They're able to, um, there's a picture uh, that's in the NIH stroke scale booklet that you show them. You'll ask them to describe it to you and tell you what's going on in that picture. And then uh, you'll give them a picture of some items for them to name, if they're able to name that. Um, then the, you'll know that there's no aphasia. You'll also be able to, you will also ask them to read a list of sentence, uh, read a sentence, tell you what that sentence means. Again, this one's on a scale of zero to three, three being mute and globally aphasic. They cannot speak or, and they don't have any auditory comprehension. Um, and a, a score of zero would be no aphasia. Number 10 is dysarthria. You can ask the patient to repeat words from a list that's uh, within the NIH Stroke Scale booklet, um, or if they're able to talk uh, in a cohesive manner, you can just have them talk. Um, zero would be normal, uh, and then up to two would be severe dysarthria. Their speech is slurred, unintelligible. You can't really understand what the patient's saying. Extinction and inattention is the next one. This is also known as neglect. Um, you may be able to identify this during your previous testing, depending on what you found. So this may not be, uh, you may not need to confrontationally test neglect. You may be able to use what you already know about if they have any kind of inattention to one side, visual uh, neglect, tactile neglect. Um, so zero would be no abnormality. And then a two would be 
uh, inattention to one side or extinction to more than one modality. So they're not um, recognizing things on that side of their body. They might not even recognize their arm or their leg, um, or they are orienting only to, to one side of their body. Robin, thank you so much for breaking down the NIH scale for us. Anytime, Lisa.